you will be acting in accordance with decent feeling, which may also influence the course of nature in your favor. The British never delivered Lynn's letter to the Queen. Impatient for results, Commissioner Lin blockaded all foreigners in their Canton factories. Then he forced the Canton traders to hand over their entire opium stock, over three million pounds. Not wanting to burn it lest people inhale the fumes, he ordered it dissolved in river trenches. These are the trenches where Lin dissolved the opium. Standing on these banks, Lin offered a prayer as the opium flowed to the sea. You wash away all stains and cleanse all impurities. You should tell the creatures of the water to move away for a time to avoid being contaminated. The foreigners do not dare to show any disrespect. And indeed, I should judge from their attitudes to have the decency to feel heartily ashamed. Far from ashamed, the outraged opium traders hurried to London to address the British Parliament. They demanded their government either pay for their losses or force the Chinese to do so, even if that meant war. A future prime minister responded with contempt. They gave you notice to abandon your contraband trade. When they found you would not do so, they had the right to drive you from their coasts. Justice, in my opinion, is with them. And whilst they, the pagans, the semi-civilized barbarians, have it on their side, we, the enlightened and civilized Christians, are pursuing objects at variance both with justice and religion. A war more calculated in its progress to cover this country with permanent disgrace I do not know and have not heard of. But Great Britain was a tiny island with a small seafaring population, the very antithesis of enormous self-sufficient China. The lifeblood of England's empire was overseas trade, and by 1839, opium was the world's most traded commodity, the linchpin of the world trading system. The position was impossible. Trade, as the West understood it, and as the British leading the West understood it, had to be open in their t on their terms. And the Chinese, as they understood it, trade was peripheral, should be controlled and minimized and kept under con strict conditions. And that was, there was no way you could compromise between the two. In 1839, the British sent an armada to China to demand satisfaction and reparation. 16 warships, 4,000 troops, 540 guns, four armed steamers, 3,000 tons of coal, and 16,000 gallons of rum for the men. In the communist version of history, the Opium War was the beginning of the long march to the communist revolution. In this version, Chinese peasants, inspired by Commissioner Lin, rose up as one and beat back the British. The reality was very different. The steamship was Britain's secret weapon. Able to motor up rivers without regard for wind or tide, it put a handful of men in control of China's waterways.
For the first time in China's history, seaborne barbarians made their way up the Yangtze River to the junction of the Grand Canal, blocking the inland waterway to Peking. That was the artery of China, and to cut that vital artery was to wound China mortally. So this stopped them, this shocked them. For the first time, the people in the Celestial Kingdom realized that they were not all that self-sufficient, that these pesky foreigners from overseas had a funny little invention called the steamship that could cause great, great trouble. In Canton, British guns pounded local forts. Then infantrymen attacked Fort Chenpi. The British troops killed all but a handful of the 700 defenders. The fort remains today, pockmarked with the bullet holes of British muskets. An American, William Henry Lowe, visited the fort the day after the battle. The fort was all battered to pieces. The inside looked more like a slaughterhouse than anything else. I saw the skeleton of one poor fellow who had been burned, probably from his powder taking fire. In going around some of the outworks, we saw the place where 300 poor fellows were buried. The sailor had put a pole in the ground over the bodies and put up a board with the following inscription. This is the road that leads to glory. To end the war, the Chinese agreed to terms. They paid six million dollars in silver to cover the opium destroyed in Canton and 12 million dollars for British war expenses. In addition, the British forced China to open Canton, Shanghai, and three other cities to Western trade. This led to a bitter irony. The treaty broke the Hong monopoly on trade, freeing Chinese traders to build up the port cities, even as it enforced Western privilege. It invites Westerners to penetrate China until it's as riddled with holes as a Swiss cheese. So it begins the process that turns China into a place which is still nominally independent, but in which foreigners can move freely from concession to concession, governed by their own laws, protected by their own gunboats, living as they pleased on the body of this prostrate giant. They all sort of joined together and worked out spheres of influence. The British had the Yangtze, then the French took the southwest, and the Germans took Shandong, and the Russians had the, had the northeast, and the Americans also took advantage. And I think this is what made the Chinese feel that it was a kind of a ganging up against them. It wasn't just one against one, it was all together, all the West, turning it on, on the Chinese civilization. The British took what would become the biggest prize of the Opium War. Hong Kong. But at the time, one British diplomat was furiously disappointed, calling it a barren rock with hardly a house upon it. One hundred and fifty years later, Hong Kong has become a magnet for coastal Chinese who have turned this tiny island into a key hub in the world economy. Today, Hong Kong residents enjoy a per capita income that may soon exceed that of the English. But in the eyes of Heartland China, it is impossible to separate modern Hong Kong from its birth in the Opium War. Hong Kong becomes a paradoxical symbol. It is a symbol of trade and commerce, of Western learning, uh, of high finance, of multinational companies, of high tech. And Hong Kong is the window toward the West. Hong Kong now performs a crucial role. It's going to be taken over in a few years by China. Uh, is this going, going to be another 
victim of the old 